So uh, we've been doing the Alpha course in this church for 13-ish years. I lose track. I don't even know how. Somebody figure out how long I've been here. Let me know later. I don't know. It's, it's around that, that time. So a lot of you, I'm looking around. I see some folks, some of the original people that took the Alpha course. Um, but we love the Alpha course, not just because of the content and how it moves folks through. It's a real process of transformation if you choose to do it. But we really, the real reason we like it is because the speaker, Nikki Gumbel, is British. And for us, it's a curiosity, right, to hear somebody speak with the British accent and all the British idioms. So I'm going to throw out a British idiom to you today and see if you get it. Have you ever heard this phrase, mind your head? Okay, mind your head. That's a British idiom, right? If, you, if, you, if you've been over in, in um, Great Britain, you've been some of the older homes over there, the doors are quite low. And, uh, you know, if you're walking in, they might say, mind your head. They might say, turn off the computer so it doesn't sing songs to you during the sermon. But that's okay. It doesn't matter. They would say, mind your head. It means duck down, right? Low bridge, right? Low bridge. I think we also need to mind our heads today in 2018. We're getting close to 2019. Because did you know that God gives out, bestows on all of us free Wi-Fi? You're laughing Free Wi-Fi. Our brains have a built-in iCloud. That means we can grab hold of thoughts and sounds, and they can replay in our head. Has it ever happened to you? Do you hear a familiar, catchy song uh, on the radio, or, or you're just walking through a store, and then you begin to sort of hum along, or maybe you sing along the song, and after a while, it starts playing in your head, right? Over, and you're like, you can't get it out of your head. You can't get it out of your head. It just keeps going. In case you're keeping track of the mystery phrases, one just went right by you. You can't get it out of your head, and you go, how does this happen? How do how does this stuff get in there, and how do I stop it? Do you know what the real word for that is, for music that plays in your head over and over and over again? You can't stop. First of all, has it ever happened to you? Boy, not very many. It's a sign of intelligence. Okay, oh, there you go. <laughs> right, so it's happened to a lot of us. It's called, and this is really a grotesque um, definition, but it's called an earworm. An earworm, it's also called stuck song syndrome. I like that better than ear. I got an earworm. To, I have stuck song syndrome. It means it's that catchy bit of music that, that plays over and over, uh, even though you're no longer hearing it. It's like you heard it once, but now it's inside. It's in the iCloud, the free Wi-Fi, and it's going on and on and on. And it has to do with things that are relative to the time, like it's getting near December, you might hear a Christmas tune, right? And that starts playing in your head. We don't normally sing Christmas tunes in our head in the summertime, so it's sort of, that's, that's how it works. And for some of us, it's kind of an annoyance. The more I worked on the message today, the more I thought, that's kind of a gift, isn't it? Free Wi-Fi. It's the gift that keeps on giving if you just want the same song over and over and over. But this earworm phenomena, it's not only interesting to me, it's interesting to researchers. They've done lots of research on this stuff to find out why this happens, how this stuff gets stuck in our head, and how it can go over and over and over. And they also have a little idea about how to extract them out, but that's later in the message. So some of the, the ones that really are uh, the, the major culprits in the study, they found classic rock standards. Okay, if you were born in the 60s or the 70s, uh, maybe even the 50s, classic rock standards are the biggest culprits. Now, occasionally, occasionally, and it's funny to admit this, I actually hear traditional hymns in my head. Crown him with many crowns. I'm doing something yesterday, and I realized... Uh, I'm, I'm hearing this. I'm like, where did that come from? But, but mostly it's, it's, uh, it's these classic rock standards. So two of the most common earworms, meaning those songs that we get stuck in our head, are the rock band Journey, and the song is Don't Stop Believing." Okay, you got that song, right? Okay. Uh, the, other one, the other one is Queen. 
It's Bohemian Rhapsody. So get ready. Get ready for an invasion of earworms right now. I see a little silhouette of a man. Scaramouche, Scaramouche, will you do the bandango? Thunderbolt and lightning, very, very frightening me. Galileo, 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 Galileo. Okay. Don't think about that anymore today. Whatever you do. We need to mind our heads. Mind our heads. You know, there are other rock groups. One is uh, kind of a techno rock group. One of the first ones, that really sophisticated kind of music, is uh, the Canadian band Rush. And Rush has a classic song called Today's Tom Sawyer. Do you remember it, anybody? Today's Tom Sawyer. So they say something in a lyric there that I found fascinating. In the song Today's Tom Sawyer, the lyric says this. You know, the mind is not for rent to any God or government. You've heard it. And I thought, sounds sounds great. It's not true. Our minds do seem to be out for rent. Or else, why would we get earworms, stuck song syndrome in our minds? So here's what I've come up with. If our minds are hardwired in such a way to record... Music we hear, our brains record it. Remember, free Wi-Fi, we have the iCloud in the head, and we can play that song. We don't even need an MP3 player, right? We can play the song in our head. There's no mechanics involved. And here's the catch, without even trying. All this happens without us even trying. Are you with me? Then it's also true that we, meaning our brains, are susceptible to repetitive input that preoccupies our thoughts and feelings. Make sense? Good. Because I'm going to show you something about that that's very important. So we must mind our heads. And I think God, God kind of senses who we are. And so God gives us a little bit direction in this. If you want to open your Bibles to uh, the book of Hebrews. If you haven't noticed it, this whole fall we've been working through the book of Hebrews. So there's a lot of talk about priest and high priest and Jesus is the high priest. Today, we're moving a little further down the road on this. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. 11 through 18. And I think that's going to pop right up on the screen. So here we go. This, is gonna, this language is going to sound familiar because it's the book of Hebrews and they're, they're, they're using some classic uh, Old Testament uh, themes and pictures. And every priest stands day after day at his service. We've talked about this before. They got to do the same thing, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. We've talked about that already. But when Christ, here's the other side of it. When Christ has offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God and since then has been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, not many, not daily, not over and over, he has perfected for all time. Here's the imagery. For all time, this has been perfected for all time. Those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us. What's the testimony? What is the Holy Spirit making testimony to in us? Here it is. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. And he also added, I will remember their sins no more. Let's stop there. I'll write on their hearts and on their minds. Now, that's great words. And and again, Terry alluded to this earlier about sometimes the way we look at things very literally. And in this case... Sometimes a literal look at particular words could, could lead us astray. 
the reference here in Hebrews, there's, there's about four references in the Old Testament that basically say, this exa- they're basically quoting Old Testament scripture right here in Hebrews. And I'm going to give you one example. It's out of the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 11, verses 18. It's going to sound almost exactly the same. You shall put these words of mine on your heart and on your soul, and you shall, for them, they shall be a sign on your arm, and they shall be as a tefillin between your eyes. In other words, it's what I talked to the, the children about today. This idea of, of placing God's laws, God's word, close. Cl- literally, when they read these things, they're thinking, okay, and, and the fancy word for this, phylacrates is one word, tefillin is another one. You'll see these words in different translations in your Bible. Your Bible may actually have that word in there, either one of those. But it's these black boxes that have scripture. So the idea was to get that scripture really close between the eyes. You wear it. When we were in, when we were in Israel, where's Mark Roberts? We saw lots of folks. Jim, we saw folks with, with phylacteries, tefillin. They're wearing them, right? Karen, you know, they were wearing them right between the eyes. Because why? Scripture says, you shall, they should be a sign between your eyes. Oh, okay. All right, I'm good. I got the sign between my eyes. Everything's great. I'm following the Bible. I'm following the scriptures. They'd also take one and they'd wrap it around their arms here. So it'd be near what? What's right here? Heart, right? So it's kind of like this deal. You know, walking around like this all day. So just to remind you. And uh, they would wrap wrap them on their hands too. So there's this whole process of, okay, well, let's read the scripture and let's do this thing. Because if we do this thing, then everything will be cool with God. Because God says, do this thing, and we want to please God, so here's how we're going to do it. But I think God knows us so well. Why would he not know exactly how our minds work? Our men's group on uh, Tuesday morning has been looking into uh, creation versus evolution, you know, kind of that idea of how we get so complex, this system that we have, these bodies, and our brains are quite complex. They're so complex that you can hear a song, and it's recorded, and it plays by itself. There's no mechanics involved. We don't know how to do that, by the way. Only our brains do. So God creates that, and it's working. So the passage just declares God's understanding of our brains, right? He says, that's not going to do it. It, it, it might be helpful. It's a good reminder, but ultimately, it's not working because you need to have the fulfillment of God's plan. And the fulfillment of God's plan based on prophecy was not that we'd walk around with stuff on our sides here and stuff on our heads here. And that would be great to say we fulfilled the Old Testament in Deuteronomy. It's also in Exodus. Again, it's found in many places in the Old Testament. Placing a verse of Scripture next to our brain, great. It's one way to interpret. There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. It's one way to interpret the Old Testament. However, Jesus and the writer of Hebrews has a very different approach. This is what was so mind-boggling to the people of Jesus' day because it wasn't about placing mechanics, right? It was a relational approach in their minds. You see the difference? One is outside. It's very mechanical. The other is inside, and that's done through a relational approach process, not ink on a scroll, not printed words on the page. All these are great. These are guides for us. These are helps for us. But Jesus seems to be saying he'd rather have you draw near to him. All right? Are you getting this? He'd rather have you draw near to him than focusing on printed material. Printed material is great. That's how we learn of who Jesus is. But that just starts to define the relationship. The Pharisees were great at putting Scripture near their bodies, right? It's obeying a very mechanical process near their bodies. Does Jesus ever hold them up? Is that the way to do it? He does not. He says, you do that stuff, but you still don't get it. You don't understand. Who does he hold up? The folks that have... God's love written in their hearts. So what's the point? 
we learned over in Israel about mitzvahs, and mitzvahs uh, means commandment. And if you hear about a bar mitzvah, it means you're you're coming. Men, boys are becoming a man in the in the Orthodox Hebrew tradition. So a bar mitzvah means you are a son of what? The commandments. It's showing that this connection. The root word there is tasanta, which means connection. It means connection. A mitzvah creates a bond between God and the commands. It's a relationship, but it's kind of an external one. It's demonstrated in physical ways. Mitzvah creates that bond between God who commands and the person who lives it out. Like Terry said, living it out. Essential. It's part of it. In a sense, the Hebrews would say that the tefillin, phylacrates, are the ultimate mitzvah. It's the ultimate connection. Because they were commanded to literally bind themselves to God. You got it? The ultimate connection to God. Now, here's where it gets really cool. Jesus is saying in the Gospels and how he describes himself, he's saying he is the ultimate mitzvah. You with me? He's the ultimate connection. It's not necessarily something you wear outside So we're commanded to literally bind ourselves to God. It's not through the mechanics. It's through flesh and blood. And that makes so much sense. That's why the book of Hebrews is so going off on the priest and sacrifice. Because that's not what it's about. It's about it's about flesh and blood. It's we want to change the human condition. It has to be done through flesh and blood. And that's the reason that Jesus basically wants to get into our hearts. It's no good just to be worn on the outside. That's why the scripture says, after those days, the law will be on their hearts, written on their minds. Not worn out. This is, this is internal language. Are you getting it? It's about an internal relationship with God as opposed to how we like to kind of keep it a little bit at arm's length, an external relationship. You know, it, animal sacrifices is an external relationship. Trying to follow rules is an external relationship. It's the difference between a relationship between two people in obeying traffic laws. Traffic laws don't make you happy, do they? Don't make me happy you get pulled over, they really don't make you happy, right? But a relationship, ah, between two people, that's why God writes with Jesus. Replacing the external burdens. It's a burdening message, isn't it? It just following rules all the time. So overwhelming, so burdening that you can't even do it. It's like, God, it's like God says, I want you to follow these 10 million rules, and I know you'll never be able to do it. So it's futile, right? He wants to replace those rules with a sound of life, right? It's Jesus, God's presence. I often say to uh, my children, when they start to get wound up in their heads, I say, don't put trouble in your head. Don't put trouble in your head, right? And that means, you know, don't give space in there. Don't give time and power inside your head to something else. Don't put thoughts in there that don't even need to be there. They don't really have any purpose. They don't don't help us. They basically cause trouble. When we put trouble in our head, we get anxious, right? We get fearful. We think out long-term scenarios that, oh, this might happen down the road. Oh, my gosh. Yet we keep doing that, don't we? And that's just the same as the Pharisees. I'll just keep wearing this scripture near my heart, and somehow it'll get through, and my life will be better. God says the scripture's in you. Put it in you. That will make a difference for your life. 
And that's why we need to mind our spiritual business. That's the name of the sermon, the title. Minding our business. Minding our spiritual business. So I'm going to give you three questions. We're, we're getting close to wrapping this up. So three questions that are going to help us mind our business. Okay? Because we get wrapped up in everybody's business. You need to be about your own. And here's how it goes. Number one, what does your mind dwell on? How would you answer that? What does your mind dwell on? Is it helpful? If the answer is no, it's not helpful, then I'd reevaluate what you're letting right in your mind. Okay? Number two, if not, what does Jesus say and the Bible indicate would have a, uh, we'd have more success if we put it in there, right? And if you get some of that sense, you could begin making some steps internally, not externally. These are all internal steps. Number three, what part of the intimacy of Jesus would he wish for us to place in our minds? What part of the intimacy of Jesus? If you come up with just a few, if you just scribble a few answers to that down, you'll be way ahead of the game in minding your business. In other words, uh, minding your head, right? The same could be said about feelings. I'm not going to go into it as deeply, but what feelings do you allow to be placed into your heart? It's the same thing. Earworms, earworms can affect your life and joy and well-being. If you just get, if that thing's driving you nuts and you can't get it out of there, man, it's the same with thoughts and feelings, feelings of anger and sadness. If we just let those ride over and over and over again with no good results, we have to ask yourself, well, that's, we'll just be in a Pharisee. We're doing the same old thing over and over again, getting the same results. So what part of Jesus, this is similar to the other questions, what part of Jesus will you allow in your heart? What exactly does Jesus want to place in your heart? It's a trick question because I'm going to answer it in just a second. God desires for us to internalize God's real presence. Let me say that again. God desires for us to internalize God's real presence, God's real purpose, God's real protection for a greater life, right? For, but also for the kingdom of God. It's not just for us. It's to serve the, the kingdom. We have such richness in us. And God says, you can use that to benefit the kingdom. So back to the earworm thing, there was the study that was done by Beeman and uh, Kelly Jabowski. Uh, they did this study in 2016, and they said, here's the methods. If you got these things playing in your head and you want to get them out of there, here's what they say do. Chew gum. Okay. Uh, listen to the song again. It creates closure. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> do a puzzle. And they said, quote, dare we say it, just let it go. Okay, are you counting how many we've hit already? Okay. Here's what Jesus is saying. He's already singing in our hearts. It says, in those days, we're in those days. In those days, I'll write on their hearts, write in their minds, the good stuff. God says, I'm already doing it. When Jesus came, it began. It is being done. It means the tune of who Jesus is is already in, within us. You know, the, uh, we're, we're doing, uh, I was talking um, with Betsy earlier about redoing kitchens. So we've been redoing our kitchen cabinets and all. So it's the cabinets and it's the countertop and it's the sink and, and all that stuff costs money. And so uh, we were watching our budget and we were, it was a little tight, right? It was a little tight. We, we kind of overextended on the cabinets. You know, you, we had a budget, and of course, what do you do? Oh, this one more thing, you know. So uh, we were running short and didn't know what to do. So we were going to hold off on the counter for several more months and keep uh, eating. I've got plywood on my cabinets. I'm like eating on plywood. So uh, I was looking for a watch because I had this watch, and I was actually going to sell it. <laughs> I'm thinking, I'll sell my watch. I'll get some money. I don't ever wear it. I, I've never worn it. It's, it's like 30 years old. So, um, and it's a collector's item. So I thought, ah, I'll just sell this thing. 
and uh, I, I couldn't find it. And I thought, you know what? I remembered something falling behind my dresser. Now, in my bedroom, I have a closet. We each, at least has a closet, and I have a closet. And in my closet, I put my dresser drawers, right? So on one side, I have clothing. The other side has dresser drawers. So it's, it fits in this little nook, just perfect. Um, but I heard something fall behind the cabinet. I thought, it must be the watch, right? So... I take all the drawers out and all that stuff, and I pull out the, 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 the dresser drawers. I won't tell you what all I found behind there. It is Florida. You can figure it out. So I pull it out. There's an envelope. There's a bank envelope. And I open up the bank envelope. There's $1,200. There's $1,200. Guess what we needed? About $1,200. And I thought, how interesting. <laughs> right, Chris? How interesting. It had been there all along. It had been there all along. Only I discovered it. And I think that's, that's the lesson out of Hebrews today. There's something in us. It's been there all along. God said, in those days, we are in those days now. It has been written on our hearts and on our mind. We just need to realize and begin to listen to God's song to God's pathway to intimacy, not just between God and ourselves, but each other. Because, you know, his grace is in the process of changing us, transforming us. That's why being written in our hearts and our minds is so important, because God's partnering with us by his spirit. And, and our response is just to hold on. Don't stop believing. Hold on, unswerving, persevere, keep striving, stay on target, all those words. Because God's not done. If God is in us, if Jesus is written on our heart, if that song is there, God says, I'm not, I'm not finished. There's more to do. Philippians 1.6 says it so clearly. Terry, we're going to wrap this up. The one who began a good work amongst you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. So what has been written, what is already there, what you're now, I hope you've discovered is there. It was there all along. It's like discovering a pile of money, man. It is a gift. It is a treasure. So what do you do? Here's the summary. Are you ready for this, note takers? Acknowledge. A, acknowledge. Acknowledge that Jesus has already written, made available his song in your heart. It's there. Two, ask. Ask. That he reveal more of that song. That's where reading the Bible really is helpful. That's where the Holy Spirit can work with us. That's where prayer, that's why worship is so important. These are the places that we ask for God to reveal truths to us. And the third and last one, attention. Pay attention to the written song for Jesus' song. For some of us, it may seem like heavy metal, maybe like a symphony. The key is to let God, through Jesus, be heard. So here's your challenge. Rock on, rap on, rhapsody on, rumba on, reggae on. Okay, Polka on, swing on, classic on. You can go on and on. That's not written down there. I just made that up just now. The key is to keep your mind on your business, which is to let Jesus reign in your heart. Let's pray.